What's up, everybody? This podcast is a conversation between me and Kent Baki from La Marzocco. Kent is... How you describe Kent? Kent's probably the man most responsible for bringing La Marzocco in to the U.S. Back in the day, he went and took some trips to Italy, kind of discovering espresso machine manufacturers and found this one really boutique, amazing manufacturer, which was La Marzocco. He was so excited about their machines that he decided to set up a distributorship in Seattle to bring them to the U.S. And the biggest client that they most famously picked up was Starbucks in the early years when they were growing rapidly and they still use traditional machines. So he's the person most responsible for outfitting all of those early Starbucks with La Marzocco lineas. Kent's been a partner at La Marzocco for years. He was formerly the CEO. I've known him for a long time as a friend in the coffee industry and we spent the day together. We were recording at his espresso museum, which is right next door to La Marzocco USA slash La Marzocco International. And we were chatting all day. I should have recorded the whole thing. And then when we sat down to do the podcast, yeah, I was kind of starstruck by Kent. He's done so, so many things that I'm really interested in. So I felt at times I kind of froze up, didn't know what to say. But really what this is, is this podcast is a chat between two friends about various things in coffee and the coffee industry. It kind of weaves and ebbs and flows. And I think it's really interesting. There's not necessarily a through line except for total full-blown coffee and espresso geekery. So if that's something you might enjoy, which you might because you're here, this will be a good one for you. So without further ado, Kent Baki from La Marzocco. My friend recently went there. Are we good? Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted, I just didn't know if we needed to do anything else. My, so my friend recently went to, I think he was in Rome and he's part of our little group of people who are in the cars and, mm -hmm. and in the coffee. And he went there and he's sending updates of all the cars, which are obviously much smaller than the ones we have here yeah. every day. Yeah. And he's trying to find coffee. So this is one of my, this is one of my burning questions that I, I knew I had to ask you. I was talking to Susan about it yesterday and she said, are you still searching for anything in terms of espresso? Cause we were talking about our espresso journeys. And the one thing that I kind of am searching for is if I was going to go to Italy and kind of retrace the history of espresso from a quality based standpoint, where would I start? You know, I, I picture it being like there's a ton of traditional Italian espresso bars, but were there a handful of ones that were better than the rest or stood above and beyond? You know, I, I remember Shomer saying in his old DVDs when he was on his journey, he's like, I'd heard the espresso in Northern Italy was always the sweetest in the world. So he goes on this trip and, you know, drinks all this coffee, finds all this awesome espresso, but like where, you know, where, if I was going to go there, where would I go? Do you have any insight on that? Wow. That's a good, that's a good question. I mean, because I tasted coffee 40 years ago, uh, I mean, when I started, uh, and my, and I'm not granted my first visits, I didn't really know anything about coffee, but my memory is that the quality in general was much higher than it and it has declined over a long period of time. There was much, there was more coffee roasters, and they were more into uh, the quality of what they're doing. And the I think the baristas were it was more of a profession, and uh, that people really took a lot more pride in their craft. I don't I don't mean that there's not decent coffee in Italy, and that people don't care, but uh, it was more prevalent in my opinion but i started in florence so i don't know what the coffee was like in in the rest of italy um and now you can find specialty roasters and you can find whatever whatever style you want but from a historical perspective i mean they always say that espresso sort of started in naples although the first machines came from milan so um that would be an interesting journey. I mean, there's coffee roasters that have been around since the 1800s or longer. But, um, you know, the coffee business and when the vagaries of uh, 
climate and everything for, I mean, uh, not climate, but, you know, you have a, a bumper year or a bad year or weather mm-hmm. that, and, and then you have all the situations from a roasting standpoint where you, you're trying to maintain a price and you have to deal with the quality of what you can get, what you can afford. And it's always a sort of a spiral um, something that happened that affected the quality of coffee in Italy, in my opinion, it's not only my opinion, is that they, in the early 80s, coffee companies started supplying the machines with their coffee. So you didn't buy the machine anymore. The coffee roaster owned provided the machine. the machine. Yeah, coffee roaster owned the machine and they did the service and all that sort of stuff. But you had to buy their coffee exclusively. So, you know, that... The concept can work, I think, in Australia and those places it does, but it's also an easy thing to keep uh, lowering the 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 quality uh, and the price. So I feel like I, I had a, a pretty good time. And before the '80s, I don't, you know, know as much about what the coffee was like. But I, I mean, espresso didn't get to be popular if it wasn't good. It's not just that you can have a bunch of espresso machines around and everyone drinks it because there's our countries that are known not for their good quality coffee. But uh, so, and, and um, so that's that's more more fodder for our museum to research. We'll have to follow back up on that, or maybe we'll have to go to Italy together and taste some coffee. That would be fantastic. I would love to do that. I, I I really want to taste the best version of traditional Italian espresso. Yeah, and I I'm sure it's harder to find now than it was, partly because of the things that you're talking about. And then I also think that there's this weird thing that happens with social media and the way we ingest things that where a lot of those traditional things kind of fall off by the wayside, and people are chasing whatever's new and cool and you have a lot of cafes that are this one is just a copy paste of the other one right um yeah. so you have a lot of designy neat looking things that'll be cool in this three to six year window right. and then nobody's going to care about them but i i would hate for the whole tradition of everything to die and all the old good stuff to just disappear i have spent a little time in southern italy in puglia and places like that not a lot of time but uh, for coffee for La Marzocco. And uh, it, um, there seems to be uh, definitely some more passion down there. Now, they're, they have a little, actually, a lot of Northern Italy's coffee is, in my opinion, fairly light. That's, that's a relative term these days. Sure. But it's a, it's a little darker in the South, which I can appreciate. But uh, that would, yeah, I think a, a journey from, North to south, south to north, in between would be would be an awesome trip. So, what was your first experience with espresso? <laughs> well, so coffee, caffeine doesn't keep me awake. So, in college, when everyone was drinking coffee, my parents drank coffee like it was going out of style. I'm the youngest of three. My brother and sister are tea drinkers, and um, I was a, a late bloomer to coffee. It wasn't until um, you know, probably I went. Um, went to Italy to in search of espresso machines that I kind of went, oh, this is what it's supposed to taste like. And, uh, and it, you know, so it was a sort of a gradual came back. Certainly I was drinking, you know, milk drinks and cappuccino and, and stuff, but um, it wasn't long before it became my daily, daily, daily ritual or habit. Um, so it was kind of, uh, yeah, I was well into my 20s before I became a serious coffee, well, serious coffee drinker, a regular coffee drinker. But what, so, so you said you were in Italy looking for espresso machines? Right. Yeah. So how were you in Italy looking for espresso machines? Okay. Well, I'll I'll back up one (laughs) one step. So my mom used to tell the story that when I was, uh, you know, young child that so my parents were from the Midwest. So coffee was a big, big thing. And, and having people over for pie, and so after people left and there was, you know, some coffee and cream left, I used to go around supposedly and finish the, the whatever was left in, in the cup um, after the guests had left. So that probably gave me some taste for coffee, but it didn't really uh, to uh, start blossoming until. Um, so I ended up uh, 
buying uh, some partners and I, we bought a cafe. Well, it was a soup and sandwich shop in what's called Pioneer Square, the old part of Seattle. And it had an espresso machine in it, which is, I think, the one you got to see, which I still have, fortunately. And I was, even though I wasn't a coffee drinker, I was really fascinated by the machine. And I liked mechanical stuff. And I had no clue how it worked. And I didn't even have enough of a clue to go around and sample coffee anywhere to see what anyone else was doing. But um, it always needed some little thing. So I started out, you know, replacing a gasket here and there. And it had a pump and motor below it that never made a noise. So I didn't know, you know, water would come out of the group brown water, but, but I had no idea that what the pump was there for. Um, and, uh, but, uh, so slowly learning bits and pieces about coffee. And then a, a guy came along to be a business partner who had lots of, uh, experience he came out of California. And so we'd, I'd go, we'd go around town and I'd pretend that I knew something about how to work on espresso machines. And, I don't think there were any two machines that were the same. I would lift off the top and look inside and go, oh my goodness, what's what's all that stuff? <laughs> but um, so at some point he said, well, if you work work on machines, we should import them and sell them. This was, you know, the 70s. It's like, well, far out, dude, groovy. Let's go to Italy, man. So in 78, we did. And that's when we met uh, La Marzocco in Florence and... Uh, CMA up in Veneto. And so that's, I only say, I, I usually say after coming back, it only took us a year to sell the first machine. But um, so when you went there, how many years in between first going to Italy and starting at that sandwich shop, buying that sandwich shop? How many years was oh, that well, progression? Uh, let's see. We, I bought the sandwich shop, yeah, or we, uh, the end of 76. And then we had to reopen it in 77. So it was only like a year and a half of doing that before we ended up going to Italy. And then when you went, did you have any idea where you were going to go? Or you just knew that they make espresso machines in Italy? Well, <laughs> we had, you know, way before the internet, we had written a company. We written about several companies. My friend had some brochures from, because he had uh, had restaurants with coffee machines. And uh, one company wrote back, which was CMA, or also known as their main brand, Astoria. And so we went to to see them. And uh, then, as it turned out, my friend um, had a niece who was living in Florence. She was American, but she's married to an Italian. So we ended up there without telling them we were coming. <laughs> and at the time in 78, there were a lot of, uh, the city was full of La Marzocco machines in Florence. And so we thought, oh, let's call up this company and see what's going on. So that's, we did that, met Piero Bambi, and uh, that started the whole journey. So we came back on that trip with two brands to represent. And uh, we, I think in 1979, we built a cart, a coffee cart that we used at some events. And that eventually, uh, a friend of mine took that over and put it on the street downtown Seattle. And so that was sort of the the first the first espresso cart in Seattle. No way. What was but that called? It, he called his coffee business Ambrosia Espresso. Okay. And... Uh, and he ran it for about a year, year and a half, and then he sold it to a gentleman named Chuck Beak, who turned it into Monorail Espresso because it was it was in the center of downtown where the monorail uh, stopped, and um, so that was uh, then. Then there was as a few years after that, there was like an explosion of espresso carts, and espresso carts started popping up all over the place and people started building carts and there were magazines about coffee and um and now it's it's hard to find a cart on the street what do you think that was that led to seattle kind of being the epicenter of this american espresso explosion uh well that's a good question i mean Seattle, especially, you know, before the internet and stuff, it was kind of, uh, other than the World's Fair, we were kind of just up here, 
you know, a lot of people had never heard of Seattle, you know, and if you talk to someone in New York, they were like, what? You got in, you still have a uh, wild, uh, oh, you can't say all those things. Anyway, <laughs> you're still in log cabins and, you know, fishing in the streams. Um, but it was kind of, uh, that period in the seventies and early eighties is when I think in America in general, uh, people were starting to wake up to food. People had gone to Europe, backpacked around, you know, and $5 a day. There was books about that. And so I'd gotten to expose to different foods and coffee and experience and then came back and ha had to do something, you know. Um, and so people were opening little cafes and little places on, you know, with a really small budget because living was much less expensive back then. So I think it was kind of a general thing. And Seattle being kind of up, you know, famous for rain, sitting in a cloud. It's always good weather for drinking coffee. Right. And, um, I mean, the Starbucks and uh, Seattle's Best Coffee, which used to be called uh, the Wet Whisker, and another coffee company that's still around called the Good Coffee Company, they all started about 1970. So that whole coincidence of people usually credit with... Uh, Alfred Pete of kind of starting that whole scene. People had gone down to Berkeley to go to school, you know, and discovered coffee through that experience. So I think it was generally a part of the time, timing. People were starting to think about different uh, gastronomical things. Okay. And uh, wanting to do the entries to open a small cafe or something that were much easier back then. And so I think it was a combination of a lot of factors. Right. And then some of those places, like Pete's early on, none of those places are really espresso focused. Right. Right. They're right. more whole bean brewed coffee kind of places. So you come back with this idea to set up a distributorship and sell espresso machines. Yeah. And did you bring machines back with you? Like what were the next well, steps in that? Well, we, I mean, we had to ship some over. And I still had a cafe, and and we had another restaurant, so um, eventually sold those off in '79, and that's when I said, "Well, I had a, a base. We were still working out of our house, so I had a basement with a half a dozen machines in it. So I thought, ah, I'll try this out for six months, see how it works." And <laughs> so I mean, then you had to. We it wasn't as much as selling a machine because. People didn't know anything about machines, but we had to really introduce the beverage to people. Right. There were a couple high volume popular espresso bars around Seattle, but uh, most people, if you if you weren't hanging out at the university or in that particular area, you wouldn't necessarily know they were there. Also, putting a cart on the street for a while, Seattle also became known besides the Space Needle and other things. That city actually became known for its coffee cart culture and um and certainly starbucks kind of uh they were they were roasting mostly for wholesale they had some retail but they weren't looking to retail expansion and they had um they had developed a really good model with restaurants and uh that was mostly filter coffee but you know all those things combined i think uh helped to put uh, Seattle on the map for that. And one advantage we have is we weren't Italian. We didn't have any connection to that. And we were romantically involved with this idea. So we wanted to do as good a job as we could without bastardizing the product, you know? I mean, obviously Americans like milk and so cappuccino and that sort of thing were, were the things that we mostly focused on, but we took any opportunity we had to introduce people to the beverage. So we'd set up a cart or whatever we could at a, you know, a food event or an art event or something. And it was, you know, it was a slow process and it was, it was an exciting time when, I mean, other people getting into the business were, we were in our late twenties. And so there was a, we were part of that crowd, people just starting to do things. Um, and so it was a, it was a fun social experience as well. And it just kind of, you know, slowly kept going forward. What was it about the La Marzocco machines in particular that was attractive to you? You know, when you went to Italy and brought back a couple brands, you brought back CMA, yeah. La Marzocco, 
So CMA had a much wider range of models of machines, and they were much more affordable. So it was a pretty interesting combination. For example, we sold uh, manual lever machines in the beginning for people with carts because there wasn't always electricity available, and you can run them off propane. La Marzocco had stopped producing lever machines in the 60s. Um, and... And so also a one-group La Marzocco was not that much cheaper than a two-group La Marzocco, where CMA had a had a good good price range of models. Then they were good, reliable machines. But, um, you know, I, w- I would say having the opportunity to meet the two founders of the company, they were still alive, two founders of La Marzocco, uh, Giuseppe and Bruno. Um, and my only regret is that I didn't spend enough time with them. They didn't speak English, and I didn't speak much Italian, so I, I gravitated towards spending time with Piero. But, you know, that the company having been around since 27, 1927, and very immersed in, in the coffee scene, uh, I, I learned a lot about coffee and uh, got much more exposed to uh, coffee and Italian coffee culture. Um, so, But it was a good good mix of of models and price range. I mean, I, I think we were fortunate to have both. Um, so how do you go from being this guy who's excited about espresso, excited about machines, from being a distributor of these things to sitting where you are <laughs> well, today? You only, know, it only, seems like a fantastic leap, <laughs> right? It only took 45 years, you know? Like they say, it only took me 45 years to be an overnight success or 20. I used to hear it 20 years and now I'm, going it's been much longer than that um like how did the starbucks thing come about well uh so when we started i mean we weren't selling coffee um although we did uh after a few years we got involved and did a little bit of uh sales of ely cafe and i had gone to ely uh early on and and learned a lot learned a lot about coffee uh and espresso from them um but uh, we had to partner with the existing coffee roasters in Seattle. Uh, I mean, we needed, you know, if somebody wants to buy a machine, you got to have coffee. So it was a, a good reciprocal relationship. And um, I think, you know, what we were able to do, it's not that it was a big plan, but we really tried to spend as much time training and educating and exposing the greater population to espresso beverages. and. Um, and so a lot of places opened up uh, small cafes. They opened up with a kitchen stove and made some brownies. Cream cheese brownies was a big thing back in the 80s and uh, had an espresso machine. And so there was a, you know, a kind of developing coffee culture, cafe culture around the city. There was a lot of uh, things that combined together. I think the the coffee companies were were promoting good quality coffee and trying to educate the public and we were tr- we were working alongside with them you know taking promoting and educating about espresso beverages and in the beginning you know there was um with the lower cost of entry getting into business and with all the other lower expenses i mean you could you had a, a lower cost on the beverage than I think percentage wise than you probably do now or, or now that it's so much more expensive to open a cafe, you know? And, and so, uh, and if you had a cart, it was even less expensive to, to get into business and, you know, the outdoor lifestyle and, and young and, and that it kind of, you know, if you just went into a cafe and ordered a cup of regular coffee, it's not the same experience as if you have a barista who's talking to you and making something there right on the spot for you. So I think all these little tiny elements kind of combine to create uh, a, a coffee culture. Yeah. So, I mean, how did you end up getting involved with La Marzocco deeper in, in a deeper way than simply distributing them? Well, we, you know, as our business, so when I talked about uh, the, in Italy, that going from 
just selling machines to co the coffee roasters, buying machines. And so um, during the 80s, when that was growing, um, Lammerzuck was a much more expensive machine. And they always had, the, the Lammerzuck always had sort of a, uh, hmm, how would you say, a uh, little antagonistic relationship with coffee roasters. <laughs> So as that method in the market grew, their sales in Italy were going down. But our sales in the U.S. were were going up. So just their kind of production sales kind of remained kind of stable. Uh, and we were about the only, uh, they had exported some to the U.K. and some into Australia and New Zealand uh, in the past. But our market was kind of growing uh, for them. So, you know, as, as our business grew and we would work more closely with them on the equipment and little things to make it more usable for our customers in the U S um, our, you know, we really developed, we had a long term, a long time to develop a closer relationship with them. And, um, so that when, uh, Starbucks wanted to start doing their retail expansion, uh, when they in '93, when they really were going to ramp it up, uh, we had a, a meeting with them, and they said we're going to open up a bunch of more stores next year. So we went back to La Marzocco and said we want to buy more machines next year, and they go, "No, it's okay." <laughs> we were going we're good. <laughs> well, why, why wouldn't you want to work harder and make yourself crazy and whatever? Um, but um, situations in Italy when you hire someone, especially then. It's you can't really fire them. It's it's probably easier to go out of business than it is to to fire someone, which which is good to have that support for the for the employee. But it it makes it very risky to expand if you can't if you don't know if you can't guarantee that you will be able to continue to grow. Right. And they'd already made various experiences in their business career, uh, so we said to them, okay, well. Uh, can we manufacture machines under license in the U.S. for the for Starbucks? And they go, okay, but you have to buy the company because there was no uh, there was no f next generation to to carry on. And uh, we'd become I didn't know it until then we'd become more than fifty percent of their business. So it was like, uh, and we'd had a a good relationship with them. So they, uh, you know. Um, felt that they could entrust the the company uh, to us. And so I put together a group of investors and we put some capital together, bought uh, La Marzocco. They gave us, they made us an offer we couldn't refuse really. And then we also had capital to set up an assembly facility in Seattle in uh, 1994. That seems like such a big step. So you're doing business with them and it's, you know, you said you had a good relationship with them. What, what do you think made them ultimately trust you with this thing that seems like such a huge piece of legacy? Well, we'd already been dealing business with them for 15 years, so I think they knew us pretty well. And I, you know, we continued to go there more frequently and I continued to study Italian and, you know, to really uh, engage ourselves with the people and the culture. But uh, they were really small, and we were pretty small. Um, and it was a really a big deal for them to see the company st stay in business. And Pierre really wanted, uh, you know, as a legacy to his father and uncle, really wanted the company to survive. And so it, it made sense to them. We knew the business. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we were, we were engaged with the equipment. Um, and we were also much more sales oriented, um, sales and marketing oriented. So, um, you know, it was a risk for them, but I think we had established a long-term enough relationship. And also there were conditions of the purchase that, you know, it would remain an Italian company making high quality espresso machines and continue to employ the people there. So the, the regardless of what we did with Starbucks or manufacturing or in the U.S., the focus was preserving and maintaining the company mm -hmm. and the factory in Italy, which which we were able to do. So. Right. 
because there's everything's still built there, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we built, I mean, things were always built there. We built machines for Starbucks from 1994 to 2004 in Seattle. And uh, so, and and when the Starbucks moved to super automatic machines, there wasn't, at the time, there wasn't enough uh, worldwide business for Lomarzoka to have two factories. So uh, we were able, you know, we had to close down the factory in Seattle and consolidate everything back to Italy. What was that time period like? Because I'm sure they were your largest account by a gigantic number, right? It was very stressful. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, you know, at that point in time, they were open, I think one year we, and we built 750 machines for them. I don't know how many cafes they were opening up at their busiest year, but um, yeah, they'd become a pretty big part of our business. And um, so, and it was just a line item, you know, to a purchasing department, you know, order all this stuff for, you know, the next, 500 cafes and anyway so it was like from one day to the next even though they had we had purchase orders from them they like any they were very careful that they maintained all their rights without any guarantees and um so it was really like overnight oh we're not you know cancel that 500 machine order we're not going to be using your machines anymore and so I felt I knew, you know, the management, the top level management at Starbucks well enough to know that that probably wasn't what they intended to do, which could could have put us out of business. So we had to go all the way to the the top level management and say, listen, I don't think you're aware of this because an espresso machine in a cafe is way down the line, but this is what's going on. And if all those machines came back on the market, there was like four or 5,000 machines were already out in use in their cafes. And if all those things had come on the market at once, uh, you know, we, we were selling, you know, less than a thousand machines a year. So it would have been, uh, with Starbucks included. So you right. take that number out, it would have been uh, a long time to re for those to come back. So anyway, they were, I, I give them absolute credit for, caring and walking their talk and being gracious. And they, they said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll finish out the purchase order and we won't let these machines come back on the market. And, uh, so they, they definitely work with us to keep that from being a catastrophe. That's really cool. Yeah. That's a cool story. Yeah. I mean, the coolest way an unfortunate situation could go. Yeah. How, how do you, how did you bridge that gap? So, just to put it in terms that most people watching this will understand, like La Marzocco as a supplier to Starbucks in essentially the creation of the espresso kind of coffee shop culture in the US, people would see is that would be like a second wave kind of thing. And then you're bridging this gap between Starbucks in the mass market to the kind of new and emerging, almost boutique barista culture in the coming online in the, I guess, late, mid to late nineties, you know, you've got people doing different things. You've got people like David Shomer probably on the front end of that with Vivace, who'd been doing it for a little bit, but then the new breed of roasters, which at the time was like Stumptown, Intelligentsia, you got the formation of the barista guild and, you know, these barista competitions that are starting in the early two thousands. How much of a, the eye did you guys have on on that and and being a part of that culture? Well, we, you know, while Starbucks was doing their thing, I mean, we still continued to s sell um, machines to the rest of the market. I mean, uh, to our market, our growing market in the U.S. And um, I, I always want to acknowledge my. I've always worked with good people. I'm. I get a lot of credit for doing all this, but. It's it's always been a cooperative partnership with uh, Barbara Duma was one of them, was my first business partner along with her partner Asa Braun and then Joe Monahan and John Blackwell these are the people that collectively we work together so I uh, sometimes that's easy to get involved in a conversation and not bring that out but I've always been fortunate to work with people and I I like being in a partnership 
So that's always been a, a really good thing. And every one of them, Joe had a lot of coffee background. Barbara had a lot of uh, cafe, restaurant experience, cooking. And John Blackwell is the legendary John Blackwell, who knows needs no introduction, but anyway, <laughs> always there to bail me out technologically. And he set up and ran the factory when we were doing um, doing things at, uh, when we were manufacturing machines in Seattle. But we still kept in touch, you know, with with what was happening um, in in the the market in the U.S. And you know, Starbucks really spawned a whole new generation of people falling in love with coffee. Mm -hmm. You know, if you'd been a barista with a traditional La Marzocco machine there, and when you moved out to whatever you're going to do next or got inspired, you wanted to, a lot of, a lot of people wanted to open a coffee bar. So, and having the experience of using a La Marzocco, that was kind of their first place. Well, it's, you know, look at that as a machine. So, um, you know, I th the the international expansion of what uh, Starbucks did to 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 put coffee shops on the map has been good in every country. It's really uh, and and gave people an opportunity to say, well, I think I can do this, and I can do it in a different way and make it put my own personal stamp on it. So it's been um, it's a it's a fun journey still. Yeah, one of, well, one of the things that I admire about your company is that you're consistently seeing, or, well, you tell me if you think this is right. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that I, that strikes me is you're always trying to stay on top of or ahead of what may or may not be going on and creating things that are interesting even if you don't think they're going to be a commercially viable thing necessarily, but almost like in it for the exploration mm -hmm. or in it for like, we're talking about the Leva machine over there. And you're like, you know, we don't have a ton of these out in cafes, but it's something that you're really passionate about. Cause let's see if we could do this a better way. Um, and you see that over, over and over again in a million different ways with just the evolution I've seen. So, you know, the first machines I worked on, the first Lumber Zoko machines I worked on were Linea Classic, mm -hmm. the big button ones. Thank you. Do you remember giving me the buttons? <laughs> you might not even refresh my memory. Okay. This is the, this is incredible. So however many years ago, you guys did a thing that was like love letter to the linea. Right. So there was a whole series of people kind of chiming in on experiences that they've had with the linea over the years. And I made a little video and my whole thing, my favorite thing about the old school classic linea, not the AV, but the EE was the rocker switches on them <laughs> are different. They're really big, and yeah. they have that um, amber light on the inside of them. Mm -hmm. The ones on the AV are smaller. Right. They're tinier. Yeah. Yeah. But the big rocker switches were cool because you would be working bar, and you could just kind of throw your hand out there, and <laughs> the switch would click, and it had a really cool tactile action yeah. to it. Yeah. And they now I think the Linea Classic, or at the time, it had switched to these different black um, rocker switches. Oh, right. There was right. a there was a change in the switches sometime around um, maybe it was oh six oh seven oh I don't I don't remember what yeah. year. Um, and I was like, if I ever build a machine, <laughs> I need to also have I need to get a linea classic, but I need to source some of those big buttons. Right. And we had a conversation somewhere or another. And you're like, I think I have some. And we ended up going out to dinner. This was probably six or seven years ago now. And you brought me a bag, which I still have. So <laughs> three gigantic Linea Classic EE rocker switches with the little light on the inside. I still have them in, in packs for whenever I build one of the mini machines I talk about building. Um, who, great. who knows if I'll get around to it, but <laughs> good, I thing, good thing you're still young, Chris. I guess I got some time. <laughs> well, I always thought that was cool. I mean, I always appreciated that about not just you, but everyone in the company seemed to be really welcoming to everybody, you know, cause when I met you or when I met 
because I've met all those people. Like I've met Joe, I've met John. And at the time when I met you guys, I was just a random new barista guy, right? Like, but everyone was super welcoming and nice to me. And I, I think there's, there's something there that's hard to put a finger on, but it's like this company culture thing that you're deeply engaged with where you actually care about what baristas do think and, and feel. And you can see that in things like, you know, you put together the street teams, like the first stratas that were built, you had that, right. you know, forum where it's like, everybody can chime in. Mm -hmm. What's your dream machine? Like if we can make anything, what, what, what would you have us make? And people are like, Oh, we should do this. You should do this. You should do this. And it seems like it would just be a fun little activity, but then you guys fucking do it. You're like, okay, cool. We'll build this thing. And I'm just kind of curious, like, where does that come from? <laughs> you know, who, like how? Well, um, I think part of the, the customer culture uh, initiated with our first visits to La Marzocco because we were, you know, wet behind the ears. And at the time, you know, in the late seventies, America espresso, it's like, I thought that the, they probably thought that it wasn't, there wasn't, they were gracious and embracing and wanted to teach us and show us stuff. And I'm sure they had no thought that we would ever sell any machines. But, um, you know, I, I've, um, I've certainly had to learn some of those lessons the hard way. Um, so, and fortunately I, um, I like people and my partners, we always were people, people people, person, no, whatever. Um, and, you know, we, we started young enough that we know we have the experience of what it's like to be just starting out and being young and not knowing much and not uh, knowing where to go for advice or whatever. So um, it's, I, I still love to go to meet new people, new baristas, young baristas, people getting into the business. And, and it, I learned so much from other people mm -hmm. and from those experiences. And I fortunately have had enough time to be able to uh, appreciate that. So, uh, so when I travel either domestically or internationally, you know, it's, a, it's, if you want to learn what's, you got to, you got to talk to people. You got to experience things. You can't just get it from a book or from a YouTube video anymore. So, um, and I, hopefully we've, we've developed a kind of culture that people want to tell us things and want to give us ideas because you can never can think of everything yourself. So, um, you know, but it, it, it takes, you know, and it's easy when you get busy to lose some of that and not pay attention to it. And um, so it's something that we we do work at um, reminding ourselves that we need to be paying attention, listening to people. And uh, so it's a, it, it, it never ends. You yeah. gotta, gotta keep it going. Yeah, it feels like a cornerstone of what you're doing. I don't know if it's a conscious effort or not, but it, it's noticeable from the outside. What? So what's up with the museum? <laughs> well, people ask, well, how did you start collecting? And I, my very first machine I bought, other than the one that was in the cafe, uh, was when we met La Merzocco and they didn't have anything. They had that, I, we go, where are all the old machines? They go, throw out. <laughs> Great. So I went there with some idea that we'd see all these cool old machines and they weren't there. So I found, uh, I found a, I think it was a one group lever model Rondini at a, at a coffee roaster in Florence and I bought it and I gave it to the factory. So, uh, but I didn't have any, then, you know, I thought, oh, well, you know, I'd like to have something. And then I saw a machine somewhere and you buy one and then maybe see another one. And, uh, it probably wasn't until the later Later in the 80s, I met a guy named Ambrogio Fumagalli who had written a small book about coffee makers. And he had worked in the 50s and 60s with some of the, the large espresso machine manufacturers. So he had been in the industry all his life. And he had started, he didn't have a lot of money, but he started building a nice collection. And he, I started buying a few machines from him. So he was one of the guys, I, I said to him one time, I said, 
Mr. Fumagalli, you really have a passion for that. He goes, Kent, it's not a passion, it's a sickness. <laughs> so, and then I met Enrico Maltoni, and, and I actually I found a fair number of machines even on eBay in the U.S. or in Italy. But, um, you know, I just, at some point I was buying machines, and then at some point I thought, uh, well, what, kind of what happened was I was restoring them over at La Marzocco USA. And at some point they said, you got to get all this stuff out of here because we don't have room for it anymore and to take care of our customers. So that's how I got to this building that happened to come up for sale. But uh, at some point I said, I'd always, I started thinking, okay, someday in the future I'll open a museum. But, you know, all of a sudden you're retirement age and haven't you done anything? And I go, oh, I guess, uh, I guess I'm going to have to do that now. So, so you've been collecting for almost like better part of 40 years. Yeah. I mean, in the beginning, it wasn't really, I was just buying machines, you know, it wasn't a few, it wasn't collecting. And then I, as time has gone on and then your income goes up and down. So that kind of varies <laughs> with what you're spending money on. And, you know, at some point I got a little more serious about it and with the idea of doing a museum. And so here we are. Do you have a vision for what you want it to be? And I, so this is incredible, this space that we're in. It's super cool. Like walking in next door, I was like, oh, this is awesome. Oh, this is incredible. My mind's blown. And then we went to the basement and you've just got hundreds of things down there. Do you have a picture of what the ultimate manifestation of this is? Well, no, it's a work in progress. <laughs> or why, or why it even matters to you. You know, what's the thing inside you that makes you want to collect and share all these things? Well, ideally, uh, in the beginning, I was just buying stuff that was cool to look at it and didn't really, you know, that that was enough. But, you know, I mean, you can go to museums and just see stuff, but it's not as engaging if there's stories to be told and in things to learn. So ideally, we would like to continue to develop so that if you don't, if you if you get stuck with somebody and you come here because they're interested and you're not into it, that's you'll find something interesting here. You'll learn something, whatever age you know, from barely able barely able to being to speak, all the way up to you know old people like like me. We want there to be something that's um, worth coming for besides just a cup of coffee, and so we want to have a coffee bar here so we can demonstrate the evolution of espresso as a beverage and to get to develop more uh stories about the machines the people in in that created them coffee culture i mean it's a it's amazing that there's a lot of different countries where people think they invented espresso i mean it's in the sense that you know they're developing their own coffee culture and, and, you know, you, there's very few places in the world that you can't find a cup of coffee. And it's, it's a great, how did you say it? It probably is the most cross-cultural thing that exists other than maybe gasoline but, or water. But, yeah. So, oh, like, yeah, one of the most heavily traded, yeah. But, I mean, you know, it's, it's drunk all over the world with, from rich to poor. So uh, anyway, so we want to continue to, to develop stories and learn more about how the coffee culture evolved. Like in Italy after war, where there was an explosion of coffee bars and stuff and with the lever machine and what were those experiences like that, um, and how did the coffee change? So there's, uh, unfortunately, every day I find another rabbit hole to go down. So how oh my gosh i'm thinking of how this whole thing connects yeah. i'm like because what i said down there i was like you need a team of like 40 people to put all these things together and get them up to spec and like the story's a whole nother level of it right what it like what does that machine mean you know where did it come from where did that because that's when i see these things i think of a few different things like immediately i just I love espresso machines. So mm -hmm. like aesthetically, they're really, they're beautiful. A lot of the old ones are just so striking to look at. And then there's the product, which is amazing. And then there's this other thing where somebody used to, somebody used to use that. 
Mm-hmm. You know, like that machine there, somebody worked on it. Sure. It had its own life and it had its own story. And that feels so important to me. I don't know if I could articulate why, but it would be really cool to kind of put these in a place in time and help people understand what it was like. Right. Because one of the things that's really interesting for me too is, you know, we get people on staff who, Colby, he had a great term for it, um, who owns Verve. We were talking about new baristas coming in and he said, oh yeah, they're, they're third wave natives or they're, you know, all of the things that we were struggling to get, you know, um, just freshly ground coffee, properly pulled espresso, latte art, properly textured milk. This was like this mountain that we were trying to climb over. They, they're just born into it. Right. This is just the way coffee is. And Mm -hmm. I couldn't expect it or why would it be any other way so people come on staff and they love coffee and they love the coffee culture and they're introduced to the equipment and there are certain things that they have never seen or used example we were setting up coffee service at meta at facebook and they're in their micro kitchens and they have a bunch of different equipment that they're rolling through and they're phasing out some stuff so we went there with mark who is one of the best baristas I know, he's our store educator. So he trains all of our team leaders and all of our baristas. And he had never used a grinder with a old school, <laughs> like flappy paddle doser. So he's looking at this thing and he just doesn't really get it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, turn it on. And then you're click, click, click. And you want these nice, even clicks. And I said, do you know what this is for? And he's all, no. And I was like, yeah. So you would turn this on, you would fill up this whole chamber and then you'd have one click for a single, two clicks for a double. And that's how you would do your dosing. And he's just, what? I'm like, yeah, (laughs) dude. And that wasn't that long ago, you know? So I've experienced that, but a lot of this stuff, I have no clue, but I'm super intrigued Mm -hmm. to go back in time. What is it like to work bar in any of these eras? Right. Have you made coffee on even, not even most of these machines, I bet. No, I have a couple vertical machines that, uh, you know, prior to World War II that are operational, but I haven't... I want to find, see what I can find some historical information on. Were they using single origin or blends? You know, what was the roast level like? What was the gram dose like? What was the the size of the extraction? I have a book in Italian from 1927 that talks about making coffee on a vertical machine. And it says like an extraction time was 45 seconds. Interesting. But I don't know what size the cup was. That book's so, in Italian. In Italian, yeah. So and uh, so now there's there's lots of a uh, lot more research to to do and to things to continue to ponder. Is that what you do mostly? Is that your day to day? I sit around and think about things like that uh, to some degree. Yeah, I, I come in every once in a while and Abby, we got to do this, and she rolls her eyes, in the back of her head gets out the pen and puts it down on the long list of things we want to do. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, yeah, because you're essentially a historian almost in that aspect. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and there's certainly a lot of people that know a lot more than I do, but... Um, you probably know more about espresso culture than anybody that I know, and I find it really interesting, and I'd love to share that with people. Is there anything you're super passionate about sharing that we haven't touched on? Well, um... I met you when you were a young barista in uh, either Modesto or Petaluma, California. I grew up in an even smaller town of Turlock, 13 miles from Modesto. So, uh, and this is just an anecdote, but at one point in time, there were two, and Turlock's pretty small. When I left, it was about 12,000 people. Now I think it's 75,000. But at one time, it had two Starbucks stores back when they were still using Linea. So that was kind of cool to go back to my hometown and that uh, there was some coffee, uh, some Lomberzoco machines there. And, um, but, uh, you know, that was uh, to, to see, to travel around and meet people like yourself and watch 
how, what you've become in 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 your in in your own company with your partners, as well as uh, you're known all over the 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 coffee scene in the U.S. You know, you're pretty well known and highly respected. So that those kind of personal stories are something that I, I still enjoy. And uh, you know, when people come to visit, we it's kind of fun here is that we'll get people that just like coffee, just they heard about a museum, they come. Not in the business, maybe don't even have an espresso machine, but but they're curious. And uh, so um, so far, it's it's a it's a fun hobby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like there's something magical about it. I, I feel like it's kind of like bringing people into the roastery. There's this unknown of how these things work and what they do, and it's really intriguing, and people can appreciate different forms of art even if they don't know anything about it. And right. That kind of strikes right. me as this, because you got this mix of art and history and tradition. You know, it's obviously really beautiful. So it's it's really it's really cool, man. I can't wait to see how it. I can't wait to see how it ends up. And the collecting part of it is really interesting because I've met a couple of gentlemen recently who are not in the coffee business, but who are, you know, buying machines and restoring them. And they may have uh, that they're, they're just at their house. They're not doing anything with them particularly, or they get into modifying and doing something. I met a airline pilot who who just bought a vintage uh, Lomarzoko machine. He lives over in uh, outside of Boise. And then a guy named Ryan Lee on the East Coast, uh, a, a very young guy who is doing beautiful restoration just for himself. And he spent some time in Italy, so he speaks Italian. And so that then there's that part of the community that's it's interesting to get to know people who also uh, share not just a passion for espresso coffee, but also for the machines. And uh, so it's um, it's an it's an ongoing uh, interesting journey. Where do you shop for machines? Uh, well, I'm in a position now that I have a handful of suppliers, so people find stuff and they call me. Yeah. So uh, I still look around once in a while, but I have to say most of my machines, the machines I have, I did not acquire directly, so I don't know their story and things. But uh, it's um, yeah, it's fascinating. I'm getting all revved up. <laughs> I'm getting all juiced up. I'm gonna build something stupid. Well, thanks for your time. I don't know how to end this. I think we're just, I could talk forever. Well, so. first of all, I'd like to say that I really uh, appreciate our friendship and our coffee friendship, our espresso friendship. And, uh, you know, I was really excited when I heard you were coming to town and we're going to be here long enough to s spend some time together because uh, it's, uh, you know, we, we come from the San Joaquin Valley, you know, small town roots relatively. And, uh, you know, I've watched you grow and develop and you and your partners and your company. And, you know, it, uh, I can't take any responsibility, but I'm very proud of you. I appreciate and, uh, that. Uh, it's, Thank you. It's, it's fun. It's very meaningful for me. So Thank you. I mean, for us as well, it's, like I said before, it's cool when you're just getting into something mm -hmm. to have people who will just talk to you and listen to you and treat you like a human. And it's it's scary to be the new guy. <laughs> you know, and that's one of the things that I always try to keep in mind. I'm, I don't know if I'm necessarily the best at it, but just remembering showing up to my first barista competition and not knowing anybody and everybody else knew each other. And I was just like, what is going on here? Am I even supposed to be here? And there were a handful of people who were really friendly and you were one of them and Andy was one of them and Eileen was one of them. And, um, Mike, um, Mike Lons, Mike Lance. Yeah, did I say right. it wrong? Dang yeah. it. I always do that. Um, he was super nice to me. I met him in Charlotte at SCA okay, when SCA yeah. was in Charlotte. And I remember those interactions forever. And it makes me want to give people those, those same courtesies. Mm -hmm. And those things aren't small because we kind of build them into everything that we do in our company too. So even something like orientation for, for new hires when they come on, because being new at a job is, is kind of stressful too. You know, you're, sure. you're coming into a culture that's already established, especially in a cafe or a coffee shop, there's regulars, you're, you're really the odd man out and being able to bring people in, 
host them at orientation and kind of set the stage for them so that when they come in, they feel like they're part of something, not just an extra standing on the side of something that's already happening. Right. So all those little, seemingly little interactions and things that people like you have done for us in the industry, they're not little at all. They're really big and they're as much of a part as what we do as anything else. So it's, it's really cool. So I just want, thank you for, for being who you are, man. It's, it's <laughs> awesome. And the team that you have here is great. Everyone's been so hospitable. This is a great place to visit. I've, been here a handful of times i love it every time it's really cool well thank you very much i appreciate that and i also want to acknowledge your your podcast and how much you give back to the business community for around coffee and nurturing and mentoring people which I th I, that's really awesome so i'll thank we try you. thank you <laughs> dude sick <laughs> this is fun Hey everyone, that's the podcast for the week. Thanks so much for listening. If you heard something that inspired you, let us know or tell a friend. These are the types of connections that are the most important to us and that we seek to create every day. If there's something you heard and you want to know more about, send us an email to podcast at catandcloud.com or head to our website, catandcloud.com slash podcast and let us know. While you're on our site, check out everything we have to offer. Dive deep into one of our single origin coffees or pick up a little treat for yourself. We have something for everyone, so check it out. Also, find us in the usual places, YouTube, Instagram. We're always there sharing amazing things. All right, that's it. Thanks everyone for being awesome. We'll be back next week. <laughs>